I love L.A. so much. I love the light. In L.A., Mulholland Drive is a famous, famous uh, road. And there's m much, much, much mood. There's so many stories about that road. And um, it's a very kind of dreamy thing to think about. You know, the, <laughs> the old story, so many people come here to try to realize their dreams. Mulholland Drive was a particular road that I remember when I was down, down, down on my luck and remember thinking, oh, this, this day is going too bad and this, is, this has been a succession of, of really bad days. I could just do a, a quick turn and just drive off this cliff. Um, no, so, I, but there are times when you just drive smoothly around and the light's right and it's, it's the opposite of that. And it's, you know, you're listening to the right song. And, and um, so I, I think it's, again, a great symbolic thing that, uh, you know, can mean a lot of great things to some people and a lot of very dark things. It, the long, unending, winding road. I just have to give you some backstory. I'd spent 10 years of auditioning in Los Angeles where you, lucky if you get to meet the director, and if you do, it's a quick five minute meeting. You might not get a bit of eye contact or a handshake or anything. And then I get this call, you have a meeting with David Lynch. And I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> this is, obviously an incredible opportunity. Anyway, nonetheless, David looked at me. Right away, eyes and connection, and he just was beaming with light, and somehow I just suddenly felt like his energy relaxed me and I was able to show myself, because I think from so many years of rejection, I'd built up veneer after veneer and thought, okay, who do they want me to be? Am I supposed to be funny, sexy, smart, shy, quiet? And I didn't know who I was anymore. But whatever the way he looked at me was just so powerful and he actually asked me questions. So there was a conversation, it wasn't just, eyes on me, I actually felt the courage to talk to him and ask him questions and suddenly we were two people. And I walked out of that meeting just like almost in floods of tears. It was, it was one of the most special, sorry, it's getting pretty cheesy now, isn't it? <laughs> so beautiful. <laughs> Headshots are one thing, but then I like to meet the people, or sometimes Joanna will, um, has people read, just talk on video. I never make them audition a scene, ever. And um, I like to talk to people, or see them talking, and uh, then I get a feeling um, about them, and I can see if, if they can make it through the film. Like I'm running scenes in my head, and they'll see this person can go this far or do that, but that it's just not going to work for that. And it go like it goes like that. So eventually, um, uh, through meeting and talking, uh, you find that I find the, the people like that. Naomi came in and did not look exactly <laughs> like the photograph that I had fallen in love with. It was disappointing. It was not <laughs> disappointing. A little bit. It was. It was. Um, uh, devastating. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I asked Naomi if she could come back yeah. uh, with some makeup on, and then she did, and we talked some more like this. Uh, Naomi uh, was friends with my assistant's son, and they were talking and jabbering away, and then I see um, another side of Naomi, and already I was maybe say 98% there. But that day, I just said, you know, 
Naomi's perfect, and uh, she turned out to be perfect. So we went to work on the pilot of Mulholland Drive. The title was going to be used as a possible spinoff of Twin Peaks, and then that didn't happen, but the title came over. We gave the pilot, not yet finished, over to ABC television. And the executive in charge watched this pilot at 6 o'clock in the morning, standing up on the phone, drinking coffee with a thing on a TV across the room, and he didn't like it. So, on the phone? Uh, making phone calls, you know, like an executive's they do. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, sometimes these things, it happens. Everybody knows that sometimes something looking very negative can be a gigantic blessing. It, it, like with Twin Peaks and Mohan Drive, it's like I see it as a, as a film. We're shooting celluloid at scenes, as actors and actresses and places and mood, just like a film. So... My friend Pierre Edelman came over from Paris for a visit, and we were talking, and um, it was very sad that this thing was stopped. And he said, well, let me talk to some people in, in Paris and uh, see if it could get money to make it a feature. A thing started that took a year. I mean, it was... Uh, a long time. A year and a half. Maybe a year and a half. I started calling um, to find out where they stored, you know, the sets, where they stored the props. I started, you know, getting a, a real bad feeling. All the props went back, they call it, back into the stream. Wardrobe back into the stream, sets destroyed. I didn't know what was going to happen. And then, right about that time, the contract got done, and that meant we we're, we're going. But I had zero ideas, <laughs> zero. And this is a true story. That night, the night of the green light, with no ideas, I sat down and did my meditating, and this particular meditation I dive down in there, and as I say, like a string of pearls, one idea after another came, and I knew exactly what to do. When David called and said that this was, might be happening, the level of excitement. And then I came back here. There were 18 pages, I think, extra. I just thought, wow. I, I mean, right away, every time you look for look at a script, there's usually one thing that really pops out and goes, oh my god, I get the whole part. I know, I know this woman I know what to do and I have to do this um, well already I had this so um, it was uh, it was obviously that audition scene now if I tell what happened they'll arrest you and put you in jail so get out of here before Be before what before I kill you then they put you in jail I cry, 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 and then I say with big emotion, I hate you! I hate us both! I remember us being in, a, in, in that building and we went to a boardroom and rehearsed um, with all the actors who also had, 
many experiences and their own version of that story to tell. Um, and I just remember seeing the smile on David's face, like, like it was Christmas. It was, it was a magical moment. It all just worked beautifully. And like all David's films, they're heightened reality or surreal or um, stylized. And, and I felt when I was doing some of those scenes, I, it, he just, he was pushing and pushing and pushing. And I thought this could be the worst performance ever, but he'll never let you go past the truth. Um, but it, it was, it, you know, I just looked back at the film last week for the first time in 15 years. Um, and um, and it was, it was up there, you know, that arrival scene in uh, the airport of, of, um, of Betty's and, and he kept saying, he was like, that's great, that's great, Naomi, but um, let's do it again, let's just go even further. It's like the first time you've tasted ice cream, like you're just a kid whose eyes are popping out of your head. And, and I was always like, I'm like, <laughs> I felt like almost ridiculous, but but it um, it it works. It's this is uh, this was her dream. David will never allow, even if the, it doesn't make complete sense to everyone, um, he'll never let it not be truthful. It has to resonate in authenticity. basically lets an actor do what they want to do and then he adds what he feels is missing and not an, in a line reading or a result even it's just a feeling that is coming to him before each scene we we spent about half an hour to 45 minutes blocking it and re rehearsing it I, I think he wants to put it up on its feet and then see what needs fixing there were times where um, we would have to do it over and over again until we until we got it. The masturbation scene was particularly difficult, and for obvious reasons. First of all, I had a terrible stomachache that day. Do you remember? No, I don't remember. And I was Sorry, making Amy. many visits to the bathroom, yeah. <laughs> and obviously it was butterflies. I was just kind of freaking out. And so David created this little tent around me. So in order to make me feel comfortable and I would go from crying to being angry and, you know, and I think he wanted to do it all in one shot, but because I couldn't get to the place, uh, um, he did this, that fabulous shot of the fireplace wall. Well, that would have that been was, in there anyway. Oh, would it? Yeah. Okay. I remember saying, you know, as my hands down the pants, aware of, you know, 35 people outside of the black tent. Um, I remember saying, David, I can't do this. I can't do it. And being mad at him for making me do it. And, um, and he, he just said on his, what do you call those things? Megaphones. Megaphones. Okay, Naomi. Okay. That's okay. No cut. Not hearing the word cut, not hearing any reloading or anything like that. So I just keep going. So I remember like being pissed. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> okay, because this is supposed to be, I'm supposed to be thinking of my lovely friend and, you know, imagining her. And, but, and I was like, <laughs> I was pissed off that I had to keep doing it. So we just like, we, I did crying, I did anger, I did, I don't know. It, it was just wildly uncomfortable. The thing with David is he uh, he just keeps you going. You 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 want to please him because he's after something really true, and and you you don't want to give up. I mean, his theory is is that we don't all have to have the same understanding. Different things appeal to different people at different times, and it's not all logical and making perfect sense. But if it's real and true, it links up and you can connect.
the theme of Mulholland Drive. Angelo and I were working. It had nothing to do with Mulholland Drive. And I don't remember why, but I wanted a Russian feel for something. And we wrote, you know, Rangelo wrote um, a Russian, uh, a Russian thing. And then we were working. I wanted a Russian, another Russian thing. <laughs> and so we were working on that Russian thing. And, but both of them kind of came to a dead end. And so I said, why don't you try, Angelo, put the two together? And Angelo kind of, his head is kind of wobbling. And he's running the notes in his head. He starts playing, and there's the theme to Mohan Drive. Unbelievable heart and emotion comes through that music. It's so beautiful. I sit near Angelo, sometime on the piano bench, and I talk in words. It doesn't matter really where we start, same way with re rehearsal, you know, you start where you start, and I talk to Angelo, and he plays what I talk. And if it's not right, I say, no, 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 Angelo, and I have to change my words. After a while, and it happens pretty fast, Angelo will catch something. Hi, Angelo, Angelo, that's so beautiful. And off, off we go. And that's how it, how it works. Okay, there's a story about Angelo from Blue Velvet. <clears throat> Angelo, we were shooting in the uh, slow club, and Angelo is playing piano when a, a band on stage while Isabella sings Blue Velvet. And so we're setting up shot. The piano is on the edge of the frame. Isabella is in the center. Angelo senses where the camera is, and he starts scooting closer and clo off, almost off the piano bench to get in the shot. <laughs> so once you get that idea about Angelo, um, <laughs> he's um, he's uh, kind of shameless. Uh, I always say, you know, <laughs> um, it's sound and picture flowing together in time. It's sound is so important, and uh, so it it just um, seems to be uh, common sense that um, sound. Um, being so important is something that you uh, work very hard on to get it to feel correct. Same way with the picture, same way with every element. <laughs> All these elements have got to feel correct. A lot of times I say picture dictates sound, but a lot of times there's it's the reverse. You find some sound or something like that that says a mood, then you try to get the picture to go with that. Or you find a piece of music and um, it a scene pops out of this music then um, you get the picture to go with that. Uh, you know, cinema is a lot like music, that it has movements and it has a, uh, it needs to be fast in this area and slow in this, and it has transitions just like a music. When all the elements are going together, you can get a thing, I always say, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So llorando, llorando. Llorando, llorando, no es fácil de entender que al verte otra vez yo estoy llorando. In this very room, one morning, where I've got a music agent named Brian Laux. And Brian calls every now and again and says, David, you gotta meet this person. They wanna just come up, maybe have a coffee and, and sing for you or do something like this. So Rebecca Del Rio came up. She's less than five minutes off the street and she goes into the booth there and John Neff is sitting on the console and hits record, not for no reason really, um, except everything's kind of set up and she's fresh off the street. She sings that version, and that's it. <laughs> and that version end up in the film. And that version got me thinking. And I'm thinking and thinking, and that her version married with this other idea, and then that whole silencio scene uh, was born. It's all 
record it. No! I! Banda! It is all a tape. In the pas de orchestra, it is an illusion. The tone of the film, there's the thriller aspect and there's the surreal thing, but there was so much humor. There's so many funny, absurd moments. That whole sequence with the shooting through the wall. Um. Oh, he has to, like, how he keeps making mistakes. I, I mean, that was just brilliant. I love it. But that's David, he, his sense of humor is Mm. One of the, one of his most wonderful attributes. And then there's the love scene too. That people. Oh yeah, you know. people love that. And I have to say, 15 years on, it was pretty hot. It's a nice scene. <laughs> it's pretty good. I'm as but, as, as sort of freaked out as I was on the day. I'm pretty glad that's on celluloid for, because <laughs> it's it's not like that anymore. It's about love. It's about love. <laughs> and it, it's so It was beautiful. tender. It was really, yeah. really. Yeah, no, it's real important. I'm in love with you. My assistant, uh, Gay, uh, she went to some f screening or something, and she told me about it the next day, and she said, oh, and it was so fantastic, because Ann Miller was sitting right in front of us. I said, Ann Miller, and she said, you should, you, she's, she's would be perfect, you know, for Coco. And I said, she sure would be. And uh, anyway, one thing led to another, and there was Ann Miller. I don't believe you met my mother. Hi, I'm Diane Selwyn. Well, just call me Coco, everybody does. Pleased to meet you. What a great gal she is. She is so, so great to work with. But everybody was great on that. Everybody was great. Monty, Monty Montgomery, like there you go. Yeah, see, a lot of those people are, are just his friends, not real actors. Well, you know, the thing is, like, I'm uh, Gay, one thing about Gay, um, she wasn't a good typist. She was, <laughs> she wasn't a very good assistant, even. <laughs> but I loved her so much, I would dictate to her and I felt like I could say anything. It was such a good feeling in the room. And so it's in, in that kind of freedom, you can say things and ideas can come freely. So I was sitting and all of a sudden, the cowboy started walking in and I start talking and, and gazed <laughs> typing. And, um, and it was like uh, my friend Monty uh, was perfect for the cowboy. Man's attitude goes some ways, the way his life will be. Is that something you might agree with? Monty was perfect, but Monty cannot <laughs> memorize a line to save his life. So it was very difficult working, but Did you have so to put perfect. up butt boards? We, Justin was holding the <laughs> dialogue, but it looked like Monty was reading, or Monty couldn't read it or something. <laughs> <laughs> and we worked hard, but um, but Monty was so good. And those are, Monty brought his own wardrobe. That's Tom Mix's clothes, and it's, they're worth a fortune. It's like incredible uh, wardrobe he had. I feel so fortunate that I found Naomi and uh, there's a line in the thing, you're gonna, you're gonna knock it out of the park. Naomi knocked this thing out of the park. She is such a fantastic actress. And since Mulholland Drive, everybody knows that, everybody's seen her, you know, shine everything she does. So, uh, very, very, very fortunate. Very fortunate. And it shows you something about life. Um, you never know. It's, it's fate plays such a role. And all these years, Naomi's um, going along with the stuff, but never gets a green light. And uh, so 
when you get a green light, it's such a beautiful blessing, and you can show what you've got. And she had the stuff. Well, thank goodness. Yeah, but it's that not you me. made that no. happen. Yes, your no, genius name. tapped into. Yeah, it's you like, it's, took uh, all the crap away from me that was telling me I was no good and not worthy, and I'm wasting your time. Let me get out of here quickly. He sat me still and said, I'm interested in you. And therefore, I was able to. <laughs> I, I, sure cry. Love you. I sure love you, <laughs> Naomi. You're fantastic, and it's, like you said, so fortunate. So fortunate.